welcome to the car guys and this week we answer the question that we've been asked the most on this channel exactly how much does it cost to have a whole fleet of supercars and is it really worth it we'll take you through all the costs in all the different areas we'll tot it all up at the end and come up with a grand total i have no idea how much it costs me a year to have the car guys collection so let's find out shall we We get asked a lot of questions on the car guys and this week we're going to answer one of the most popular ones no it's not the one about whether jason and i are a couple we're not it's not the one about how we made our money we're both entrepreneurs i used to own a business and sold it jason still owns his business no the question we're going to answer today is how much does it cost to have a car collection how much does it cost to have a brace of supercars and classic cars and is it really worth it ironically i'm in one of the cheapest cars in the collection the original honda nsx this episode is inspired by shmi 150 who not that long ago did a video talking about the costs to him of owning his car collection he's got quite a few less cars than the car guys but he does own some particularly stunning and very expensive cars like the new Ford GT and like the McLaren Senna. He's also a lot younger than we are and with youth comes great risk in the eyes of insurance companies. So it's no surprise to find that his costs are much greater than the car guys even though we've got more cars. I found his video very interesting and it struck me that we've never really talked about the actual costs of running these cars on the channel. And hopefully you can give us lots of feedback about whether you thought this was interesting. I would much rather live in ignorance and not really know how much these cars are costing because I have a suspicion that when I find out at the end of this video, I think I might feel a bit embarrassed and possibly want to reduce down the number of cars that I've got. Like having your own racing team, having a collection of supercars is an incredible way of burning through cash. And never has it been more truer said, how do you get a small fortune? Start with a big one. So before we get into specifics, what are the main categories of expenditure when it comes to cars? Insurance, fuel, road tax, servicing, tracker costs, number plates, MOTs, cleaning and protecting. The list is endless, frankly. Once you've got more than, say, four cars, the costs start to get out of control. Now, I appreciate that this is not a problem that many people have, and you may say that I should shut the hell up, because it is, of course, my own fault that I've got so many cars, but it's my passion. It's what I'm interested in. Some people have model railways, some people play golf. I collect and drive cars, specifically supercars. The biggest cost, of course, is actually insurance. And Shmi highlighted the same thing. Now I've got a policy with Zurich, which allows me to run a whole fleet of cars all on one policy. And it's very easy for me to chop and change cars and jump in and out of them. Everything is covered. I'm obviously covered to drive anyone else's car, fully comprehensive, and that's pretty important when you're doing things like the car guys, but that does not come cheap. You've got to give an indication of mileage and on some of the more expensive cars like the F12 TDF or the 458 Speciale Aperta, mileage is more critical on those cars. The big difference, of course, between the car guys and Shmi 150 is age. Both Jason and I are in our mid to late 40s. And when it comes to insurance, that makes a very big difference. So I can fully understand why Tim's Senna is costing him £15,000 a year in insurance alone. To put things into perspective, at the moment I pay just over £18,000 a year for all of my cars. As you'd expect, the less expensive, less driven cars in the collection, so this Honda NSX for example, the Honda Prelude, they're all very, very cheap to insure, we're talking less than 200 quid a year. You'd be surprised incidentally how relatively affordable the Lamborghini Gallardo is to insure. 
or the Challenge to Dali. The F40, for example, was about three, three and a half thousand pounds a year to insure, even though I probably only did a thousand miles. The highest, of course, in the collection is the F12 TDF, but then it's also the most expensive. If you've got an 800,000 pound car, it's going to cost a lot to insure, and mine costs anywhere between three and a half and five thousand pounds just for that car. But every year the insurance level changes, very often it goes up and up and up. Thankfully, for the first time probably since I started driving in 1991, my premium is now going to start to come down. But that's enough about insurance. And now we come to either the first or second largest piece of expenditure of a car collection. In some years it's the second largest, this year it's the largest cost, and that's servicing. That's right, if you want to keep a collection of beautiful supercars or hypercars or classic cars, you have to be prepared to service them regularly, and I service all my cars every year. Now, when it comes to Ferrari, which of course is my favorite brand, Ferrari currently have a seven-year free servicing plan. So a new Ferrari, you will not have to pay a penny on servicing for that car for seven years. And that is truly glorious. I appreciate that people with Kias have been enjoying this for a long time, but can you imagine having something like a Ferrari with free servicing? It just boggles the mind. And when you've got 15 or 20 cars, remember you are servicing a car more than once a month. There is a full service happening one and a half times a month. That is terrifying. It's logistically annoying because obviously you've got to book them in, you've got to arrange to get the car there, you've either got to drive it yourself or get someone to give you a lift or get it transported. You've then got to liaise with the dealership on the service itself if there's anything that needs doing and then you've got to get the damn thing back again. Some cars are far more costly than others. Here's the top five most expensive cars to service in my collection. Boop. And as you can see, this year, the Ferrari 355 beats all of them. This year has been what we like to call the big year on the 355, because it needed the cam belt changed, which is an engine out job. And whilst you've got the engine out, it's a good idea to get loads of other things changed. And actually, I'm expecting the bill for that 355 service to cost as much as my annual insurance this year. The Lamborghini Gallardo Valentino Balboni, considering I hardly drive that thing and probably only do about 500 to 1,000 miles a year maximum, always, always, always has something that needs doing, whether it's a hose or a grommet or a slight rattle or a tire, is never less than two and a half thousand pounds. Just thrown away. Because when I pick it up, it drives exactly the same as it did when I took it there. So you don't get any perceived benefit whatsoever. So servicing costs, even on a good year, that's gonna cost you at least 15 to 20,000 pounds a year, just that. And that's, with, that's without anything really going wrong on any of the cars. Car tax. I'm not sure if it's the case in whichever country that you are watching this in, but certainly in the United Kingdom, you basically have to pay a six month or annual charge just for having a car on the road. And in theory, that money goes towards the upkeep of the roads themselves and the road infrastructure and hopefully it helps pay for some of the emergency services that have to attend on those roads. But it's generally there to pay for all the wear and tear on the nation's highways. Whether it actually does or not is open to debate. And car tax tends to be assessed now on things like engine size and how much of a pollutant the car is. Now I'll go through all the car tax levels for all the cars that I've got. Sometimes it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But generally, you're going to end up paying somewhere between 240 and a thousand pounds on car tax every year per car. And again, 15 cars, you do the math. Now we come on to the MOT. 
that is the Ministry of Transport test. Now you may have an equivalent in your country. Here in the UK we have a quaint old Victorian law that says cars must be roadworthy. You have to take it to an MOT test centre every year, doesn't matter whether it's a Ford Focus or a Pagani Zonda, they all have to do it. Are the wheels still on the car? Do all the lights work? Does the handbrake work? Do the brakes work? All the basic things that if they fail will lead to an accident. I am always forgetting to MOT my cars. The MOTs quietly run out, there's no fuss, there's no reminder. It's only generally when I come to tax the car that I suddenly realise. And then I've got to have a frantic moment where I have to find an MOT test centre, I've got to book it in, I've got to get the car MOT'd before the tax runs out. You don't have to MOT the cars for the first three years of their life when they're new. Fortunately, the cost of MOTing a car is not great. If you get it done whilst your car's being serviced, the dealership will often slap on a 10 or 15 pound extra charge. But if you take it down to say Halfords, which is a chain of sort of motor bits, car maintenance centers in the UK, you've probably got an equivalent in your country, it only costs 35 quid. So Halfords is my preferred choice. And many of you were very amused to see that I took a McLaren 675 to Halfords to get it MOT'd. But the MOT test is the same regardless of the car. So who cares? I might take the TDF there next. Other costs when you've got a bigger collection, cleaning, unless you clean the cars yourself, and occasionally, just very occasionally mind, I will clean my own cars. I used to get great joy from cleaning my car when I had one. I used to love it. It would really teach me about the curves of the car and all the little details, and I'd spot all the little nicks and dents and things. You've also got protecting the cars. Now, that does mean wax, for example, which literally I have never put on a car. But more importantly, it means PPFing. It means covering the car with a thin layer of armor-plated protected film that are cut precisely around the joints of the impact areas to make sure that the car is free from stone chips. Many of my cars are PPF'd, many aren't. If I have a special car, then I will PPF it. If I have a rare car, then I will PPF it. The front end costs probably two, two and a half thousand quid. If you want to do the whole car, you're talking four to five thousand quid. And if you want to do a whole Rolls Royce Phantom, it's 10,000 pounds. But to not do it is very often a false economy. And I'll tell you why. My Speciale Aperta, it was all over PPF'd and someone backed into it in a car park. I thought the back bumper and carbon fibre splitter was scratched and I thought it was going to have a horrendous bill, but the PPF completely protected it. When I peeled the PPF back, there was not one mark on this car. If you have expensive supercars and hypercars, or if you've just got a car that you don't want to see nicked and never seen again, shout out to Tap Bells, I feel your pain. Generally, you've got to have your cars fitted with a tracking device, which means that if they are stolen, they can be tracked down pretty quickly by the police with helicopters and SWAT teams. But there is a cost. You've got to pay to have the thing fitted in the first place. It costs something like four to 500 quid. And then you've got to pay an annual subscription to keep it running. And that costs anywhere between 100 and 200 quid per year per car. Tracking companies also do not remind you that the tracker subscription is running out. So you've got to keep track of that yourself. It's quite ironic, isn't it? You actually have to track the trackers to make sure that the tracking is still working on the tracking companies. The other annoying thing about trackers is that they have little plastic dongles which run out of batteries every six months and give you no indication that they are about to run out. They all look the same, so if you've got multiple ones, you have to label them individually, otherwise you've no idea which one it is. And they're very sensitive, so very often they won't work properly. Another avoidable cost, if you own a collection of cars, is private number plates. Now, I am aware that there will be a section of people watching this who believe that private number plates are for bellends. And I do partially agree with you. However, when you have an older car, it's sometimes actually quite cool to take the age off that car by putting on a private plate. Buying private plates can be an expensive business, 
So the plates that I've got will range anywhere between 1,500 pounds and 12,000 pounds. Once you've got your favorite cherished plate, you can keep that forever and just swap it onto whatever new car you want. So don't see it as a wasted cost because number plates do go up in value. It's a legitimate investment device. Only the good ones, mind. Wayne 5555 probably isn't gonna go up. Sorry, Wayne. So you have the cost of the plate itself. You then have the cost of putting it on the car that you want to. There's a admin fee of something like 80 quid from the DVLA in the UK. And then you have another cost of about 80 quid if you wanna take it off and put it onto another car. And then we come to fuel, which actually, strangely, is one of the cheapest costs of owning a car collection. Why is that, Damien? Well, because unless you're driving a car very regularly, you don't put that much petrol in it. So the majority of my cars, although I do drive them, you've got to figure that what am I going to put? Maximum of 10 fill-ups a year for a lot of them? Something like two, 3,000 miles on a lot of the cars. It's not a lot of fuel, actually. I hope you found that useful and I hope that gave you some insight into what it's like to have a collection of cars and what the costs are involved. I'm not expecting any sympathy, nor do I want any. It is all of my own making. It is all self-inflicted. What we're going to do now is tot up all of those costs and come up with a grand figure. So let's head back to Car Guys HQ and do some numbers. Okay, so here we are back at Car Guys HQ and it's time to reflect on the true cost of ownership of a fleet of supercars and classic cars. Now these costs are of course based on a full year, 2018. They do change all the time, so one year is never the same. Insurance is 18,600 pounds for the year. Fuel is 4,800. Road tax, 8,646. Servicing, now this is a big year for servicing. It's not usually this high. £36,731. The tracker costs £3,151. Registration plates, again, varies by year, but this year was £3,300 for one new plate. MOT costs, relatively cheap, £570. Various types of cleaning for the year, £1,350. And protection, PPFing, uh, we did one car this year, all over £5,500. So I've no idea what this actually adds up to, but let's find out, shall we? So the grand total is... Grand total, 82,000. <laughs> 82,848 pounds, 82 grand, 82 grand. Yeah, that, that's, that's a lot, isn't it? That's, that's, I mean, make no bones about it. That is a lot of monies, uh, a lot of the Queen's pounds. Wow, I never expected it to be that much. Now, I suppose we should caveat this with the fact that uh, it was a heavy servicing year. So within the servicing figure, we've got £20,000 just for the Ferrari 355, which is very unusual. So, uh, so yeah, so that makes a bit of a difference. But still, that's a massive number. Wow. Holy sh... Thank you for watching this episode on the costs of owning a car collection and a fleet of supercars. Hope you enjoyed it, hope you found it interesting. Please subscribe, leave comments and likes. We read every single one and we massively appreciate it. It helps us make better episodes in the future. There'll be another Car Guys episode along next week.